All right, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to, to step in as moderator for this final session. Uh, and I'm stepping in as moderator because David Tolbert is yet another of our people who is ke single-handedly keeping Uber afloat. Uh, <laughs> he will be here shortly from Augusta. There will be donations at the door. We'll <laughs> I was just thinking they should have been a co-sponsor of this event, uh, politics of Uber notwithstanding. Uh, the, um, uh, and I will add, this is a scheduling note. Uh, I know many of you have been here all day, and I know it's been a long day. Um, Mary Burton, who flew in from South Africa and was a commissioner on the commission, as I've talked about before, in South Africa, is in an Uber as well from Greenville. Her ETA is 4.50, so that will mean overtime, um, to cite one of my students, which I like it. Uh, so uh, if you have time and if you're able to stay on, I would encourage you to do so. So after this supposedly final panel, now penultimate panel, uh, has concluded, we will invite Mary to make some remarks and observations from her experience on the TRC. Again, speaking to flexibility, although it will be interesting after our whole day to see, with her not having heard the discussion, what her observations are on the TRC process. But I would encourage you, if your schedule allows, to please stay on for Mary. This final panel has as its goal to take the three prior panels and think about the title, From Rhetoric to Action, but thinking about the compendium of the three sessions we've had to date this morning and earlier this afternoon, and start asking some of the questions that indeed uh, some of the questioners on the last panel began to ask, and how would we take the things we've discussed today about restorative justice, about experiences abroad, about the history of the experience here in the United States, and bring it together towards an action plan. And uh, we will have three panelists who've had a chance to hear all or most of the morning, parts of the morning, Fania who arrived at four in the morning uh, in Atlanta, and then, and, then, and then here at eight, yes, um, uh, only heard part of the morning. Uh, and, and then we'll have the interesting observations of David Tolbert, who won't have heard the day's panels, but will make observations on the theme uh, nonetheless. So I think we'll have an interesting conversation here. And I want to point out that I'm going to have a very light hand as a moderator. I really want, so many of you have been here all day, you to have a chance to engage with the panelists fully in this last session. So uh, I'm going to begin with, uh, at Fani's request, I'm going to begin with Jennifer first and ask her to make her a few observations on this topic. Then I'm going to ask uh, Chief Miller and then Fania in that order, and then David when he arrives. Jennifer. Um, so maybe I'm here to be able to prove that I'm not a pie-in-the-sky academic that can only talk to you about how we ground this in relational theory, but, but that actually then that does have implications for what we do and how we ought to do it. And so I'm just going to make a couple of uh, links. And I do so, you know, in, in that context, having uh, been involved in the South African TRC some and, and in the design of the Canadian uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission for Residential Schools, which was another one that was happening around historic wrongs in a, in a non, um, depending on how we measure conflict, but in a non-conflict, post-conflict context. Um, and, and really then trying to actually do what the purpose of this panel is, is in taking all of the insights from that and other experiences um, and trying to apply them as we've just recently designed uh, the first public inquiry in Nova Scotia in Canada to work through a restorative lens, so a restorative public inquiry uh, complete with um, an agenda for addressing systemic racism in our province uh, in the wake of the history of a particular institution called the Home for Colored Children. And so if you have further interest in that particular model, um, the terms of reference and mandate and information about that are on, on the web at restorativeinquiry.com. Uh, CA, and I'm happy to talk to you more about that. But as we did that, we had to really think about uh, how were we going to use this as a catalyst opportunity um, to make some change, right? Because we have a limited mandate, a short period of time, um, and we were doing that from the perspective of former residents who had uh, called for this inquiry and were trying to um, lead in terms of what they wanted it to be. And what they didn't want it to be was um, a typical model where what it produces is a report with a bunch of recommendations and no change in the relational environment, no change in the relationships and the political will to actually uh, make any of that matter. And so what they wanted was a public inquiry process that was really focused on how do we change the way in which we relate, model new relationships with government, with former residents, and with the African Nova Scotian community. There was an immense amount and continues to be a struggle within the African Nova Scotian community um, because the, this home was run by the community with largely uh, children from the community in it in the early stages. 
but in the context of uh, significant long-standing systemic racism. So some of the things that, that were very important there were that was the design process, was that we brought together all of those parties who were the primary stakeholders, uh, former residents, those who run the home, uh, those who are um, uh, working with the government, and we spent a year and a half actually designing it. Um, and we were given the political power that whatever we designed would in fact be the model. Hi. Hi, how are you? He's arrived. Hello, everybody. David has arrived. Hey. Uh, so that was very significant in terms of there being both political will and a power sharing so that those conversations uh, could be meaningful. And then we designed a process that is uh, oriented entirely around action in real time. So using this not as a process that at the end of the day we look at the recommendations and hope there will be political will to implement them and have a body telling others what to do. So a great example of this is the final speech that Murray Sinclair, the head of the Canadian TRC uh, made, which was to say, you know, what we've done is shown you the mountain and there's a path up it and now we've got to walk it together, which is true. And we had a great political change of guard in Canada that made their calls to action actually heated in the Canadian context and we, we continue to feel the urgency of those calls to action. But had that not been the case, we would still be looking at the mountain with the path and have no idea how to even begin to figure out how to walk that together. And the former uh, residents of the Home for Colored Children wanted us to start walking the path. Uh, figure it out as we go, chart a path together. But if we didn't chart it together, we'd never move really on it. And so this entire process as it is currently unfolding is designed around uh, how do we um, uh, gather knowledge, come to understand with one another, figure out what matters about that, and then c participate together in action planning processes to actually make some differences and set uh, our capacity to work together for further change. So I think that design process was really key in getting to a stage when we had a model um, that we could actually do that work within the model. The last thing I'll say is, you know, I think we're very cognizant that we have a lot of manifestations of, of uh, systemic racism. Some of you may not know that Nova Scotia is the home to the uh, oldest um, African population in Canada. Um, they refer to themselves as indigenous blacks. Um, they've been there since before the founding of the country. And so uh, we have a long history of systemic and institutionalized racism that we need to reckon with. And so there was a very clear sense that we needed to deal with the Home for Colored Children and the abusive history there, but we needed to do that recognizing that it was the beginning of um, creating capacity for us to look at the other manifestations of racism. And so the issues of systemic racism and that analysis have to be central to our work. And I think that's translatable in terms of thinking about what do you need to do here. I think if you think about Patricia's comments about how do you work ground up, and then how do you think about connecting the dots of what you're finding ground up mm -hmm. and the order in which that work should be done. Thank you, Jennifer. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, Good afternoon. I, I would like to, uh, I guess, begin by uh, just kind of uh, prefacing my, my comments that I think that we are, we are all creatures of our environments and uh, whatever those environments may be. And so for me in policing, uh, outside of the military policing side of it that I did coming out of high school, my municipal policing experience was largely in Charlotte Mecklenburg, uh, followed up by a four year tenure as a police chief in Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, and now police chief in Greenville, South Carolina. And in each of those cities, um, uh, Policing has uh, an essential role and function uh, for community, promoting community safety, uh, the absence of crime, the absence of fear. Uh, and, and yet in each community, uh, the police have had a slightly different culture. Now between the three, only 180 miles separates all three. Um, Greenville's about 90 miles from Charlotte, and Charlotte's about 90 miles from Greensboro. So uh, when, but they are all three very different police organizations, um, but the issues in managing those police organizations are very similar. And the community issues and the conflicts with the police are all very similar. And, and so, um, 
as we talk through those issues, I may sound a bit provocative, uh, and uh, I don't intend to be provocative in a negative way, but there are some realities from a police perspective uh, that I think create obstacles for the, the kind of change that we would like to see. Um, and certainly that we hear, and I have heard in three cities. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of the demographics, and I, I'm, I'm going to look at my notes here because uh, for a body camera grant a couple years ago, uh, I actually dug in as a new chief in Greenville. Uh, I actually dug into the community demographics a little deeper than what I understood them to be when I moved there. Uh, so 20% of the city's overall population of about 65, 66,000 people live in poverty. So 41, and, and by the way, the uh, demographics of the community, even before I get into that, are that the, um, the African American population in the city is 30%. And the... Hispanic population in the city is just under 6%. The Asian population is 1.8%. And the white population uh, sits somewhere about 62%. So 20% of the population lives in poverty. 41.7% of African Americans live in poverty in the city. 25% of African American families earn less than $10,000 annually. So one quarter of 30% of the population um, earn less than $10,000 a year it, within the city of Greenville. It's a beautiful city. It's a lovely city to live in. But that is a huge problem. And so when we, when we look at that and we say, okay, well, let's look a little bit different. Per capita income variation for African Americans compared to whites is negative $26,934 a year in that community. Whites, uh, po uh, white population married, 44.7%, um, while only 15.8% of the African American families are married. 94.9% .9 of the white population has graduated high school, while only 70.7% .7 of African Americans have graduated. And then finally, um, nearly 32% of African Americans, one third of African Americans receive food stamps or some sort of SNAP assistance. So there is a significant disparity um, between the white community in Greenville and the African American community. Uh, and there are um, socioeconomic conditions that uh, promote dysfunction. I think, in our African-American communities. And much like Greensboro, uh, which was a, I will say, a very segregated community, um, Greenville is also a largely segregated community. So uh, when I look at crime in general and reported crime or requests for uh, police service, we have a disproportionate request and report rate in our African-American communities. Uh, we did in Greensboro, and we did in Charlotte. And, and so when we look at violence and drug-related crimes or reported crimes and requests for police assistance, very disproportionate requests and reports uh, out of our African-American communities. And again, our communities are largely segregated. They're not homogenous, but they're largely segregated. And so when people talk about over-policing, um, I, I appreciated uh, Prince George uh, County Chief's presentation um, because in Charlotte, we were very proactive in collaborative um, uh, policing strategies and and I can talk to some of those as time goes on I'll, I'll reserve those comments maybe later as we go through but 
But the point of the matter is, is we still largely go, we're response driven. We largely go where people need us. We largely go where people ask for our help or where people are reporting to be victims. And city by city, community by community, we are disproportionately called to our African American communities. And so when we talk about reform and policing, our police officers are trained in the law and they are trained in their authority. Uh, the things that they can do to triage a situation, to, to de-escalate it momentarily, that's what I mean by triage, um, to try and settle a situation, calm a situation, but we're generally not built for sustained engagement by one person over many hours or many days. Uh, we are um, really response oriented around the country. And so our tools of the trade, the things that we can do are we can cite, we can arrest, we can enforce the law. But we can't compel people to do things um, that we can't compel them to do things that without the assistance of a court of law. And so some of that becomes tricky for us when we're trying to implement change in communities. But, but while we do things in the police department to sensitize our officers, and, and in both Greensboro and Greenville, uh, both departments have brought in the fair and impartial policing. We talked about the difference between fairness and equity earlier. Uh, and that is an important distinction. Uh, we talk about implicit bias. And a lot of my 21 to 25 year old officers don't believe it. I do. They don't believe it. They haven't seen it. They haven't listened. I'm not African American. I haven't walked in your shoes. But I've listened. And I've seen situations over 30 years in policing. And I can tell you that my read is implicit bias is real. It's a function of human behavior. It occurs in every one of us. And it's how you manage it and control it that is so important to change in policing. So that fair and impartial policing training uh, I brought to Greensboro and I brought to Greenville. Um, I can tell you that the reception was warm by some and icy cold by others. And that is a culture issue in policing. The, to open ourselves up to walking a mile in someone else's shoes, to be sensitive to those issues and those needs, community by community, uh, and making sure uh, that we do right by people. But I can also tell you that when I look at some of our communities, we need that same level of introspection. When we have a code of silence in a community, we can't help you. And so when we talk about change and reconciliation and, and conflict resolution between the police and the community, we have to resolve conflict in the communities because the majority of our, of our violent crime victims are African American and they were in all three cities. And the majority of our violent crime suspects are reported when we, and, and in violent crime it's a, generally a good measure because you mostly see your attacker, or African American. And, and as much as I don't like saying that and you don't like hearing that, that's our reality in policing. We're called into communities, we're asked to do a job, we're asked to stabilize communities by people who largely are afraid. And so we have to work to reconcile those issues, I think, to resolve conflict long term in our communities. And between police and, and particularly our African American community. Uh, but what I heard here today, and I'll wrap up with this, what I heard here today uh, particularly with the last panel, is that this really does, this can't start at a state level, it can't start at a national level. It has to start community by community, and it may need to start neighborhood by neighborhood, where people are coming together to try and say, 
we can't continue to live like this. We can't continue to have the police in here, day in and day out, stopping us all the time. The police will tell you, we're just trying to keep you safe. You're saying you're an occupying force, and we get it. But I'll tell you, we're caught in the middle of that whole conversation when we're in administrative roles and leadership roles because we're trying to promote safety and we're trying to address your concerns and needs from an over -occupa occupation of policing perspective. But if we're not there, we can't help you either. And so we have to talk about those dynamics within the community. What causes people to victimize other people in neighborhoods, one neighborhood to another? And I think if we can come together around those issues, I think we change the structure or the construct of policing in a way that is much more preventive in nature uh, much more focused on the core issues and the key people. And we heard that earlier too, and I think that's an essential element. So don't focus with the net, focus with the spear. And I think that was uh, Chief Bowman that mentioned that. So, so pick off the, the predators in a community, but at the same time, don't prey on everybody that we're trying to focus on, or don't focus on everybody just the predators. So, so I think as uh, in policing, the way to, uh, my estimation, is the way to begin to bridge the gap is to begin and take a community that is very troubled uh, and wants change and begin to have that dialogue at that community level and begin to focus the police resources and the community resources uh, at at those needs that are identified through that analysis, the needs analysis. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Miller. I, I'm going to turn next to Dr. Fania Davis. As I do so, I just wanted to point out, I, in the interest of time, I didn't introduce all of our speakers because in your programs you have detailed bios of each of them, and I wanted to give a maximum amount of time uh, for them to speak, and I'll now turn to Dr. Davis. Thank you so much. Um, I want to uh, thank the organizers of this event. Um, it's it's, oh, sure. Yeah, I may start uh, talking softly. Um, I won't be falling asleep, though. I, I need to at some point. Um, um, so I just want to thank the organizers for this um, amazing and timely um, and so needed event. It's the only one, it may be, it may be it's the first one that I know of that addresses uh, truth and reconciliation processes to address racial violence. Uh, so I want to honor you for that, and I want to honor you just for going above and beyond the call of duty. You know, they say when you do great things, you'll uh, have great obstacles, and you certainly had a lot of obstacles in the last couple of days with the storm that came through and the travel difficulties. So I just want to honor you all. Thank you. And I want to honor my dear friend, old family friend, and wonderfully talented uh, poet, uh, Nikki uh, Finney, uh, who unfortunately I missed this morning. I think I was just arriving at the time. Um, and I want to say, too, that this is a significant event because historically, truth and reconciliation processes, transitional justice processes, have been viewed as something that those other countries with those massive and pervasive human rights violations need. Those countries with the dictatorships need, down in Latin America, those countries in Africa, you know. Um, so I think it's really good that we're starting to, we, are, we point the finger of blame at countries uh, for genocide and for massive human rights abuses. <coughs> but as an old African proverb says, when you point the finger of blame at somebody else, watch, because you've got three fingers pointing back at yourself. We are a post-genocidal. We are a post-slavery land. Um, it doesn't matter that it's been all of these years. We still very much, the past is not past. It's still very much with us. And so I think it's, it's historic and important that we are finally um, starting to see ourselves that way in the way that other countries see us um, by talking about how we use these strategic peace building processes, how we use these transitional justice processes here in this country. 
and how we address the massive uh, human rights abuses here in this country. I wanted to say a little bit about myself. I, um, for almost 30 years, was a civil rights trial lawyer and just about 10 years ago started doing restorative justice um, with youth uh, in Oakland. Um, I come from, someone mentioned Birmingham, Alabama this morning. I call it Bombingham. We call it Bombingham, uh, of course, because of the frequency of bombings, not just the Sunday school bombing, which was referenced here today, but there were hundreds, if not thousands, of bombings uh, during the civil rights era in Bombingham, Alabama. I lived on Dynamite Hill. That was really the name of my neighborhood because of all of the bombings that took place there in part uh, to retaliate against people who were very active in the civil rights movement, but also because our family, along with other families, moved into a previously all-black, all-white neighborhood. And the response of the Ku Klux Klan, the White Citizens Council, uh, was to terrorize us. And that was terror. And in fact, this nation was born in terror. And there we go again, pointing the finger of terror, the finger of terror when in some ways, many ways, we are you know, the original terrorists. Um, and after a, I lost two friends in the Birmingham Sunday School bombing. Um, and those experiences, lo losing my friends and, and seeing uh, the bombings and going out every day and, 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 and being exposed to the pervasive messaging that you're subhuman and uh, you're you're less intelligent. You don't deserve uh, the, the, the amusement park or the film, uh, the, 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 the cinema, uh, because of the color of your skin. Um, coming through that experience uh, kind of created a warrior for justice out of me, and I left the South, uh, becoming involved in every possible movement after the civil rights movement as a small child, of course. I became involved in the Black Power Movement, the Black Panther Movement, the Black Nationalist Movement, the Women's Movement, the Socialist Movement, the Anti-Imperialist Movement, the Anti-Apartheid Movement, Peace Movement, you can go on and on. And I became a civil rights trial lawyer after my sister was the object of a, an unprecedented FBI manhunt. Um, she was on the 10 most wanted list because, and charged uh, with uh, capital murder, kidnapping, uh, uh, essentially because of her political activities. And after she was captured, after several months and, and brought to trial, she was acquitted. Uh, um, and um, I, have, I have an experience when I was, I had an experience around the time that Angela was uh, arrested, just before that. My then husband and I were attacked by police because of our work in the Black Panther Party. They broke into our home and they shot and nearly killed my husband. We were on, uh, uh, or I was, I went underground and um, I was, there was an all points bulletin out for me as armed and dangerous and I turned myself in, my husband survived. But all of these experiences sort of made this uh, warrior out of me and it caused me to become a civil rights lawyer to fight racism in the courts. And after 30 years of all of this fighting and anger, and I was full of rage, uh, I felt out of balance, and I knew that I was being invited to bring more healing uh, energies, more creative energies, and more feminine energies. Uh, you have to be hyper-masculinist and hyper-rational and hyper-aggressive to be successful as a, as a trial lawyer in our adversarial system. And I became out of balance because of that. And uh, long story short, I kind of serendipitously ended up in a PhD program where I was able to study with healers around the world, especially with Africa and I was apprenticed in, in traditional healing. And then came back to this country and learned about restorative justice. And it was a real epiphany be, for me because it, it uh, integrated the lawyer, the healer, and the warrior. I could be a healer. I didn't have to give up my warrior past. I, I brought it along with me. I could be all of those things, lawyer, healer, warrior at once. So I really love to go to law schools these days and talk about uh, healing and law and, and about lawyers being healers. I was just in Northwestern Law in Chicago um, and I love that experience. It began actually with some drumming by Native American elders and chanting and, and um, for me it's, it's, it's just historic, you know. 
Um, I go to law schools and I do yoga and, and ask them to do meditation. So, and lawyers are talking about becoming healers. And that uh, symposium that I went to and sh at, the, at Northwestern Law was entitled Healing Justice. So it's, I think it's wonderful and it's needed and it's timely that we are talking about becoming healers, even uh, those of us who are lawyers and judges, because that's what is needed. Um, I want to kind of uh, just uh, um, piggyback on what Dr. Patricia was saying uh, earlier about how it's probably a good idea for us to consider more bottom-up traditional uh, or um, uh, truth and reconciliation processes as opposed to the traditional more top-down process, which makes more sense if we're talking about a restorative justice inspired and a restorative justice informed process because restorative justice is is participatory, is very community-based, is very relational, and uh, because, of course, of the uh, national climate um, as well. And as I was saying a little bit earlier, um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna call what I talked about earlier about the outrage, as really an example of a bubbling up, a kind of bottom-up process of truth-telling that's been going on in this nation especially since Ferguson. I, all of the examples that I mentioned earlier, all of the media, the social media uh, 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 explosion of, of uh, conversations about race. Um, you know, you open up the newspaper and you see that an, an, an NBA official or, or a, a football coach has said something and is being fired because it was a racist comment. We haven't seen this historically. It's new. Um, and it's new, too, that universities are starting to look at their roots in, in slavery and in the slave trade. Harvard, for example, uh, has, is renaming buildings that had been named after slave owners and renaming them after the slaves that worked for those slave owners. Uh, Harvard is also has removed their shield or their emblem because their, their emblem contained the shield of the, or the family crest of a slave owner. Uh, Georgetown has established a commission to tell the truth about, to investigate and tell the truth about its roots uh, in the slave trade. And not only are they writing reports and, and having meetings uh, about to tell the truth about their history uh, in, in, in the slave trade, but they have contacted the descendants of the slaves uh, who were sold to support Georgetown, and they are working with them now to figure out, what, well, what do we do? How do we make right this terrible wrong? How do we make amends? And this is not just happening at Brown and Yale and Harvard um, and Georgetown, but it's happening in many universities around the country. Um, there is a network, mostly of southern universities, and some of you may know about it since we are in the south, but there's a whole network of universities that is doing the same thing. This is new. This is historic. And this is an example of truth-telling that is not mandated by a commission of experts uh, that, that are, are commissioned to uh, um, listen to uh, hundreds and thousands of witnesses and go through reams of, of documentary evidence. This is not a, a mandate, a demand from someone up above. This is coming from below. I think it has a lot to do with Ferguson and a lot to do with the change climate that we're seeing. We're also seeing truth-telling happening um, with the Ferguson Truth-Telling uh, Project. Unfortunately, Dave, who was going to be on this panel, couldn't be here today. Uh, we're seeing um, truth-telling with EJI, Equal Justice Initiative, Brian Stevenson, who couldn't be here either. They are doing uh, lynching reports, reports on slavery. They are also collecting money to create a lynching museum. Um, they, are, they are installing plaques all around the South because the South is, the landscape of the South is dotted with so many memorials to Confederate uh, 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 soldiers and generals and slave owners and very few, you can count them on one hand, uh, dedicated to slaves and uh, lynching victims and um, heroes in the resistance uh, movement of, of, and the freedom movement of black people. So he is changing that. He's actually going, they are going to lynching sites 
to the thousands of lynching sites around the country, collecting uh, the dirt from those sites, putting them in a jar, and bringing them back to Montgomery, where the lynching museum will be, and, and, and putting them on shelves. There are hundreds of these, uh, these uh, bottles of, of soil, and that soil will be used in part mixed in with the concrete, uh, which will uh, be used to build the lynching museum. Um, so there's a lot of truth telling going on there. Um, and there's also some memorialization, commemoration, a lot of plaques being laid. I was just in Abbeville, South Carolina a, f a few months ago. Uh, Anthony Crawford, uh, who was uh, lynched 100 years ago that day that we were in, 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 in Abbeville, um, and there was a big, big commemoration of that, and there was a plaque that was, um, that was installed right in front of the courthouse near where uh, Mr. Crawford was lynched, simply because he was a landowner. He was probably one of the wealthiest black men in the state of South Carolina, and he was taking some cotton seeds to the market and got in a dispute with the white man about the cost, about the, the price, um, and he was lynched uh, shortly thereafter. The, the point is that um, people are, it's not just EJI, but it's the families of lynching victims that are also joining uh, with EJI to have these ceremonies across the South. And we have the Northeastern uh, Law University Restorative Justice and Civil Rights Project. That's another example of truth telling that's going on. They are uncovering the cold case. I know I'm way over time, but I'm give me. Did you see me do anything? I'm, oh. I'm fine. I have no worries. That's good. Okay. Continue. You're going to interrupt this. Uh, okay, so, so uh, there's Margaret Burnham and the North, uh, Northwest, North, Northeast Law uh, Project on Civil Rights and Restorative Justice. Uh, she is taking her students down south. She worked in the South. She was in Mississippi. She was part of the Freedom Ride, and she was part of the voting rights work that was done down there. And she is discovering all of the hundreds and thousands of people uh, who were martyrs of the civil rights movement but are unknown. Cold cases were killed, and we don't know today still who killed them. She and her students are investigating. They're finding out not only who killed these people, but they're finding their families who were often uh, exiled up north. Uh, there was a family in Chicago, and one day she called that family and and told them that we wanted to and we want to invite you to come back to Texas, and there's going to be a memorial um, that's uh, that's going to be installed, and and there's going to be a ceremony, and there's going to be a street renaming ceremony. There's going to be uh, a, a public apology for the loss of your your grandfather or your forefather, and they cry and say, I've been waiting for this call for 40 years. So they're doing this. They're, they're um, uncovering all of these great heroes and forgotten martyrs of the civil rights. That's an example of truth telling about the violence, the pervasive violence that occurred during um, uh, the civil rights movement. And then we have truth telling in the movies. There's 12 Years a Slave, there's a Nat Turner story, there's Hidden Figures, there's Loving, there's a United Kingdom, there's Bell, there's Selma, and, and you can go on and on. Unprecedented, this is new for us. Well, it's kind of like the 60s in some ways. Um, and in popular con culture, we had Beyonce, you know, and the Black Panther performance at uh, the Super Bowl, and we had Kendrick Lamar at the Grammys, uh, which had a, he had a mass incarceration theme, black men incarcerated and enslaved, basically. So there is, there's a massive amount of truth telling that's going on, even though there's no Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It's, it's kind of, it's a spontaneous process that's happening. Now, we, we can have, we have examples of truth telling but not reconciliation, and that's another story which, you know, we'll talk about later, uh, not healing. Uh, but I, I, I want to say that it's important that this work, and I'll close with this, um, uh, be grounded um, by, or be staffed in many ways by, I don't want to say staffed. All I'm trying to say is that I think restorative justice practitioners have a special role to play in truth and reconciliation processes, I will call them. I won't call them, or truth and truth recovery. Um, but I'm talking about truth and reconciliation. 
uh, because I'm talking about the healing. We need to make the structural changes, but we also need to heal our relationships with one another as citizens of this country. Uh, otherwise, we will continue to perpetrate, to perpetuate the initial trauma, the original trauma of slavery, uh, which we got rid of, but which morphed into lynching and morphed into Jim Crow. We got rid of Jim Crow. That morphed into mass incarceration. That morphed in, so that racial terror that is at the essence of all of these historical institutions continues. And we can get rid of, we can get rid of prisons or we can, we can change policing. But if we don't address that trauma, it's gonna to continue to perpetuate itself in a different form. Just like a child who has a trauma in the early years, if that trauma isn't healed, she will per, uh, perpetuate that trauma. It will perpetually be reenacted. Uh, so we need to go through a healing process, just as I needed to go through a healing process. The nation needs to go through a healing process. And restorative justice practitioners and facilitators are skilled in, in these processes. We can bring together um, a killer with the survivor of their victim and bring about some healing. And if we can do that, we can certainly bridge the racial divide as restorative justice practitioners. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Fania. Mm -hmm. David, we're going to ask you to cover the first three panels. You're, you're, Oh, yeah, we're watching the live stream, I'm sure, en route. Yeah. Uh, and, and, yeah, and, and, the, uh, and the airport. So, yeah. <laughs> David, we're thrilled to have you, and we welcome your thoughts and remarks. Well, you know, I prepared to, prepared to be the moderator of this uh, panel, and I have all of these great questions to ask. But now I'm supposed to a I think I'm supposed to answer them. Is that right? That's you what you ask do as a panelist. <laughs> uh, and I'm very honored to be here. Um, I am from North Carolina, uh, but I, my family is from South Carolina. And uh, if you read, uh, I did an op-ed that came out in the Huffington Post today that some of you may read about. But my, my family was an anti-slave Republican family after the Civil War. Uh, my grandfather fought the Klan, um, mm. ultimately took his own, own life. And there's mm. a deep story there. Mm. So although I've spent, although I've spent my is I that hope better? Everybody heard that. Yeah. I hope everybody okay. heard. Did everybody hear what he just said? No. Oh, please repeat that. I, yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yes. One of the things my wife, who uh, is a very perceptive woman, says, "Talbert, you have a lot to say, but nobody can ever hear you." So <laughs> she calls me Talbert. She's only called me David three times, yeah. and the divorce was imminent. So, uh, <laughs> I was, uh, I was first reflecting just on one of the reasons I made so much effort to come here, uh, despite the wind, winds and the rains. Uh, and I want to thank the organizers and my friend Anthony. Where is Anthony? He must be here somewhere. I, yeah, poor Anthony he must have called me a thousand times. David, you've got to come. You've got to come. <laughs> Even if you have to take the train or plane, automobile. So I got here. Um, and I was saying that one of the reasons that uh, I came and that this means so much to me to come to South Carolina is, although I'm from North Carolina, but just across the state line uh, in the mountains of North Carolina, my family is from South Carolina, uh, mostly Greenville, but uh, other parts of the state. And my family was opposed the opposed secession, opposed slavery, and uh, they certainly didn't pay the same price that African Americans paid, and I don't want to imply that, but um, they were subject to their houses being burned down, and their, uh, my, 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 uh, my grandfather was a, was a lawyer who defended African Americans and um, ultimately committed suicide from all the pressure from the Klan, burning crosses in the yard and so forth. So it's a very much a personal reason for uh, for, for coming here. Uh, also, uh, and as I say, as I was saying earlier, I put some of this in this uh, op-ed that is in the Huffington Post today. Time to give attention to this important conference. Uh, also, uh, I feel like I followed uh, Chief Ken Miller around because I lived in Charlotte and uh, I 
was in Greensboro, and my parents are from Greenville, and I went to Furman University, so I feel like you're my shadow, uh, you Chief Miller. <laughs> um, and, and I thought I would just make a, a, a few comments uh, about what I, the pervasive issue of race in American society. And I would join the comments that have already been made. Um, but I, I do think, and, and I, always, I often get this question of the relevance of other countries' experience. Uh, I spent uh, nine years working on former Yugoslavia, nine years at the Yugoslavia Tribunal. I spent uh, a, good portion, a good bit of time working on the Khmer Rouge trials in Cambodia. Um, I worked on Lebanon. I worked in the Palestinian situation in the Middle East. And in ICTJ, we work all over the, all over the world, in Latin America, um, in the Colombian peace process. I see my good friend Javier here, who's probably covered all of that. Um, but and, you know, throughout Africa and Asia and uh, ver various other places. Um, and there are a lot of important experiences there. I think what we see in the US is something that's, uh, um, that you perhaps can draw some lessons from, but you know, an industrialized, developed society, which at its heart and, and, and really in its founding has, is, was based on a deep injustice, and that's slavery and, um, and genocide against Native Americans. And we have gone through 200 plus years really 300 years um, of not just, not just lack of acknowledgement of those deep crimes, continuing deep crimes and abuses, um, but uh, denial of those abuses and those crimes. So the question is, how do we begin to move in a different direction? And I would I appreciated very much the comments other panelists made, particularly about the important, um, the important efforts at the local level and through civil society efforts. Um, I would, of course, and I think we all want to see uh, action at the national level. The president, whatever president, should issue a full-throated apology for what has happened to these groups. This has really never happened. And Reagan apologized to the Japanese Americans. But there's never been, I think, any kind of formal apology, something that's very important on the national level. Um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of national commissions, there have been some efforts. Uh, the Kerner Commission in the 60s, I think, was an important commission. I don't know whether anybody's familiar with that, but uh, made some ex extremely important recommendations but they pretty much went on the shelf. They were not implemented. They were. So we failed on the national level and the political dynamics on the, uh, on the, uh, on the national level are pretty, pre are very uh, extremely depressing. I'm not sure whether any better term I can use. I could use a, some, some other words, but I think for this audience, I'll just say extremely depressing. Um, so I do think that efforts at the, the local and, uh, level are very important, but, uh, and I want to come to Chief Miller's uh, comments in, in just a moment, but I, I, while we look sometimes at the surface in, uh, in relationship to relationship between the authorities and affected communities, we're not looking deep enough because these, these issues go back back hundreds of years now. Now, if we're going to be serious about addressing them, the, they cannot be Band-Aid solutions. And the economic issues that underlie the racial issues are, 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 have driven so much of the abuses. Um, and we see it today in terms of mass incarceration. We see it in the tension between uh, police, com the police and, and, and minority communities in general. So until we wrestle with that, and I, th I think at this place, the political space is at the, at the local level, or maybe not at the national level. It's with a lot of groups that, uh, that need to lead this charge, and I think that's why this, uh, 
this, this conference is so important and such an important place that not too long ago we saw what I think is the fruition of um, a lot of things that are bubbling underneath when we see the massacre in, in, a, in a church uh, not too far from here. And the Confederate flag, it takes that to take the Confederate flag, which is a symbol of racial abuse, of slavery, of segregation um, down. So I think on the symbolic, so even in a really difficult national situation, when we have uh, an office, um, someone who um, abuses and, and uses uh, and attacks and, and instrumentalizes racism and, uh, and the attack on the other, I think that civil society and people like you and people like uh, that are on this panel need to drive that process. And we have to, we have to work in the lo local area, on the local level, the state level, and, 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 and push very hard to see that acknowledgement happens on the, at, at every level. That the, the monuments the, that are built to, slave, to the slaveholders need to come down. They're all over Washington, D.C. We finally have an African American museum in Washington, D.C., 300 years late. But how many slaveholders statutes uh, stand in Washington, D.C.? If we come to the issue of, uh, of the police in African American communities, I have a lot of respect. I've read for what, what uh, Chief Miller has, has accomplished. But I do think that it's, it's not simply with local police departments. I think there that we have to have a much more engaged discussion and set of reforms to, to address this issue. Now, part of it I think we have to, to realize that, uh, that uh, not only do we need reform of the, pol of the police, we I come back to this, this issue of the economics that drives some of these forces. And I think the era of mass incarceration I think uh, if you see the, you can read you can read some books or you can you can watch this great movie called Thirteen, uh, which you can watch on Netflix. And the the element of he's not really kicking me; he's just yeah, stepping on my toes. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you see that if you see the movie Thirteen, uh, I, I think you can you can Thirteenth, sorry, yeah. um, you can. You can, you, it, it comes across in a, in a very, very powerful way. Um, uh, and with respect to the police uh, 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 issue, I think some of the things that uh, Chief Miller has done, I know that uh, he's worked in cities that where we've seen some improvements. I think that's, that's something that um, is important to note and important to implement, but I don't think I think this is really an important element, is that you know, the police represent the society as a whole, or they're supposed to. This is a societal problem. This is a deep, enormous societal problem. And we cannot simply say it is about the police or it's about one element of this society or another. We have 300 years, or is it 400 years, of history that has not been dealt with except in drips and drabs. And until we confront that history in a meaningful way, I think driven largely by social society, we're not going to be able to kind of have the kind of reforms and changes in a society that live up to the kind of society the, that the rest of the world had perceived the United States to be. So those are a few off-the-cuff comments, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, David. And actually, um, you ended with one of one of the questions that I was actually going to ask. So I might ask the whole panel to comment a little bit on this. The, the topic of this panel was thinking about rhetoric to action in the specific context of the topic of the symposium, which is bridging the divide between African American communities and law enforcement. And the question I would ask the panel is, is it possible to really bridge that divide in isolation through restorative justice? It, are there advantages to focusing on to piecing, piecing out a single issue and using restorative justice mechanisms, whether at the grassroots level or at other levels, 
as a way to, be, to further engagement? Or as David's comments started to suggest, is it um, a process that, that will face hurdles at a minimum and maybe ineffectual at a maximum where you haven't addressed larger, longer term historical inequities and modern day inequities that stem from that long history? So I wonder about the reflections, and maybe, Fania, I'll start with you, and we can ask others well, to come as well. I've been talking so much. Why don't you start with someone else? I'm sorry to take over your role. Well, listen, <laughs> I, you know, I will happily hand it over. I'm not being paid a penny. <laughs> Jennifer. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, it's never good to talk in place of expecting to hear Fania Davis. Um, so I'd say maybe both. So I do think that while it's so hugely significant that it's bubbling up from the bottom and that we take um, and that we take seriously the mobilization of dealing with issues in communities and in regions where they arrive, there is something about trying to create coordinated space for the public significance, the political will of those individual activities. So while I'm, I don't think the solution is you need a Truth and Reconciliation Commission tomorrow, I think starting to talk about the national need for truth and reconciliation, for truth and reconciliation in a way that is not only the sum of its parts, but greater than the sum of its parts. So what would supporting a process that does come from the ground up, but knowing that you're wanting to track and be intentional about that and see that wisdom shared um, so that there is movement building, right? So that there is connection and I, I you know, I think, um, you'll find you give it like an, an excellent list of like all of the things that are happening and how do we make sure that as they're happening we're intentional about convening, connecting, so that when we, then when there is time to be able to think about all we have learned about what we're doing, we're in a position to do that, but also you're from a national level inspiring, creating momentum, creating permission, creating space for that because that's an intense amount of heavy lifting absent that creation of a national momentum, I think. And maybe the other thing to, to address your question is like, what? well, do you start with one issue or do you start with the grand? Mm -hmm. I think people find it very hard to start, to know where to start with the grand questions. Mm -hmm. Like that, of course, we need to be addressing those. Of course, we need to be connecting these uh, per precise manifestations of the structural inequality and systemic racism and to the way they manifest. But there is something about ensuring that 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 people can access that. So, so here I come back to the Home for Colored Children again. This is a small example, actually, in the history of Nova Scotia's racism, although a really important one for its complexity in terms of the relationships between and among those within the African Nova Scotian community and in the larger context. But whereas we've talked a lot, it started with our premier apologizing for the history of systemic racism. Mm -hmm. And we t people will say, yes, we know that, but they don't know what that actually looks like. They don't know where to unpack how that showed up. And so they don't need, know where to recognize where it still shows up. And so there is something I think really important about taking multiple issues, but doing that in a very explicit way as part of a whole. Right? I think that that is the only chance you actually have of immersing people in what this history of racism continues to look like and feel like and the, the, the effect it, and impact it had on people uh, to equip them for the way they need to be different. I think there is something really um, helpful about that. Chief, well, actually, you just... I, I, saw, I saw the look, but, I, but, I, but let me say this. Um, I have a specific sub-question maybe for you. Um, you. You served as police chief in Greensboro. One of the things we haven't spoken about in detail today is the Greensboro Truth Commission. Now, I, for the record, Nelson Johnson was invited, was unable to attend. Um, but I, I do wonder, because when, when we spoke on the phone at one point, you talked about being a chief there a period, in a period after. and. Some of, and your observations, I wonder if you might make a couple of thoughts about that because I think it speaks to this question a little bit. In, in, in one of our examples, one of our only examples in the United States of a truth commission ex ex exploring this particular specific issue of this conference. Sure. Um, so I, I don't know if everybody understands why Greensboro uh, in this room understands why Greensboro had a truth and reconciliation commission. In 1979, on November 3rd, there was an incident involving the Communist Workers Party um, 
members and the Ku Klux Klan members. Uh, Communist Workers Party uh, group was from Greensboro. The Ku Klux Klan group was from China Grove, uh, about, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 miles south of Greensboro. And um, there was a little bit of back and forth that had preceded the event of November 3rd. And so the Communist Workers Party held a death to the Klan rally in Greensboro. And my understanding of the events preceding that is they traveled to China Grove uh, to let the Klan members know that they were holding this rally. The uh, Klan members in turn uh, decided to disrupt the rally in Greensboro on November 3rd. The police department was aware of the, of the rally. Um, there is some question, I think, that even remains today as to whether or not the um, organizers uh, of that rally, one of them being Nelson Johnson, uh, actually switched the location of the rally uh, and failed to notify the police. And the police version of that is they showed up at the point of uh, the rally and nobody was there. Uh, and so they waited around a little while and then they decided to go to lunch. And they were in a restaurant uh, or eating lunch wherever they ate lunch and when the Klan members uh, learned of the rally. Or, or arrived at the rally and there was conflict. There were guns drawn. There is some question about who drew which gun first. Um, and uh, I'm still not sure that's reconciled. Uh, there are a number of things I think around that day that are not reconciled, but there were some uh, video cameras and you can look it up if you look up the Greensboro Massacre online on, on YouTube, you can actually see the video of the uh, shootout occur. Um, but, uh, but in any event, uh, five Communist Workers Party uh, members uh, were killed in that uh, ensuing gunfight, and it created um, uh, much conflict for the community. The community was, I, I think, in large part um, racially divided anyway. Uh, I think it remains that way today. Uh, in the four years that I was chief of police there, uh, Elm Street is the main street for that community, and uh, everything is defined in terms of east of Elm or west of Elm. And um, all the conversations that we had uh, were defined in the same way. And so the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that came about, uh, again, long before I got there, um, I don't know that the community as a whole bought into that process to begin with. Um, I, I might be speaking a little out of turn on that. Somebody in this room may know more about it than I do uh, because I was not in, involved in Greensboro politics and Greensboro events uh, prior to about early 2010. And so uh, it, it appeared from all of my conversations that I had after I arrived in Greensboro, that w it was that the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, really one of its findings or, or uh, recommendations was that the local government issue an apology. And the local government failed to issue an apology because I think to, in some respects because of the information um, not being able to be fully reconciled about who did what uh, and some of the personalities involved uh, made it difficult for them to issue an apology, but they issued a statement of regret, which didn't go far enough in many people's minds. And, um, and so I think that community essentially uh, backed away from that reconciliation process and just used the other structural um, institutional managerial controls to work through conflict that would uh, occur subsequently. 
but the the uh, while I think it could have worked, I again not being involved in the actual process itself, I'm not so sure uh, that some of the people that were close to it. Um, uh, enabled it to work. I, I guess the best way to say that. I know that during the trial, and I've, I've spoken to the prosecutor uh, in the trial of the Ku Klux Klan members, the Communist Workers Party uh, folks simply did not participate. They would not assist um, in the prosecution of the Klan members. And ultimately, uh, they were acquitted or they were hung juries, or but they ultimately were not uh, convicted. And so that was then used against uh, the community or the, the, the white power structure, if you will, and uh, so there was just continued conflict uh, in that community around that event. And quite frankly, as the Greensboro police chief, I was asked to, I was asked to address um, the issues of 1979, uh, 35, 36 years later. Thank you. David? Um, these are not directly an answer to your question, but part of it is a little bit about the history. Kim, the history. Um, I, was, I was living in Chapel Hill when it happened, and I remember it, and I remember talking in law school, oh, ta talking in law school about I was saying that I was. It's just like having a yes. She's just a little bit better looking than Ken. That's all. <laughs> um, but I was. Um, what I was going to say, I was in Chapel Hill at the, the time, and I remember it very vividly. And we took a, we took a class to discuss it. Um, I, I I think it does. Um, I'd like to come back and talk about reconciliation a little bit because sometimes I think that is a misunderstood or misused term. I think reconciliation comes out of accountability. Um, so if you're going to have reconciliation, you have to have truth, you have to have accountability um, in the case of the in the case of the shooting with the Ku Klux Klan and so forth. Um, you can't have non-prosecutions, so bringing people to criminal justice when it's, when it's appropriate, having the truth out there. Reconciliation is hard, but I think it has to be rooted in accountability. That is, we don't, we don't simply try to say, let's bring these parties together. I think the only way you have reconciliation in terms of what we're going in the United States is deep acknowledgement about what happened in the past, not simply by historians, uh, not simply by local communities, but I think it has to be on a national basis. Now, whether that is by a commission, whether that is by some other process, uh, there has to be some acknowledgement of accountability before you can hope for, I think, reconciliation. And I, I think sometimes by talking about truth and reconciliation. Um, we, the, tr the order is right. We have to have the truth. We have to have accountability. I think that's the basis of reconciliation, particularly when you're talking about um, the large number of victims and the long history uh, of these abuses. We, we have to have accountability, and it may be in the form of criminal justice, it may be in the form of truth, which I think is an important form of accountability, it may be in the form of reparations, and it also, I think, is very important um, to get the history books right, that the, what, what truly happened is not covered up. And I, th I think we can look at other industrialized societies that have come to grips to some extent with horrendous abuses. Uh, Germany, uh, if you look at Germany, which obviously uh, had the Holocaust, um, you can go to Berlin and you can see enormous monuments that address this. The history books changed. Uh, I'm on the Nuremberg Academy uh, um, in, in Germany and the, the level of apology, remorse, and 
and, and addressing this in education has been, in, has been systematic and deep. Obviously, one concerned, gets concerned uh, from time to time with neo-Nazi movements and so forth. But there was a deep, deep historical wrong that a society began to address in a whole number of ways. And they continue to do it. Now, uh, there's a different situation than what we're talking about in the United States. But until you have accountability in, in a number of forms, until you acknowledge what has happened, and I, ultimately I think this has to be official. Um, I don't, obviously I don't think this is gonna come out of the White House uh, this week. But uh, I think that this has to be a long-term process that we work for, that civil society uh, pushes very hard for on the local level, uh, and on the national level. So those are my comments. Um, uh, on, on Greensboro, um, I, I think that the narrative that we just heard from uh, Chief Miller um, is contested, and I say this respectfully. Um, I have a different understanding, but I don't want to, you know, get into a debate about that here today. Um, if you go to the ICTJ website, mm -hmm. there are a few pages on the Greensboro Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, and there are also some YouTube videos that will give another perspective. Um, and, and I'm just going to say one thing. My understanding was that police actually knew they were forewarned that the violence was going to occur at that at the morning side projects, I believe it was, um, and they intentionally did not show. That's that is the conflict. Yeah, that's yeah. So that that's one the of them. That's there was a Klansman that testified um, at at the um, truth and reconciliation hearings as well. But I don't want to get into a back and forth on that. Just, there's a lot of information out there. I think someone from the ICTJ wrote a book about it as well. Jill. Yes. No, it wasn't Jill, it was somebody uh, was else. Wasn't it Lisa? Lisa Magaron. Lisa. Lisa, yeah. Lisa yeah. Yeah. Right, right. It's a very good book. Yeah. People should read yeah. it. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. It's a sales pitch. <laughs> <laughs> From the executive director? Of, no. The president. The president. <laughs> That's how we fund the Uber trips. Planes, trains, and automobiles. It's all I just, about funding at the end of the day. <laughs> I also wanted to address the first question. You know, T, the TRC is not a panacea, as someone said earlier. There's so many... Uh, deep um, uh, issues, uh, economic issues, uh, educational issues uh, that we can't necessarily address through a truth and reconciliation process. But my thinking is that just as I was saying earlier about the women's movement being much more intersectional now with the January 21st March on Washington, where they said that it's not just reproductive rights. It's not just breaking the glass ceiling um, uh, that are women's issues. And historically, uh, the women's movement has addressed those issues, which are white, you know, the issues of white women or perceived as such. Um, but at this rally, um, it was, Clear, the clear message was that mass incarceration is a woman's issue. Uh, women are incarcerated, women have sons and daughters and husbands who are incarcerated. They're the ones who support those who are, in, that's a woman's issue. Uh, Islamophobia is a woman's issue. The water in Flint, your family is being poisoned. That is a woman's issue. Um, environmental degradation and uh, climate change is a woman's issue. Misogyny is a woman's issue, of course. Homophobia is a woman's issue. Um, and um, globalized capitalism is a woman's issue because it's driving a lot of the suffering that we're seeing economically. Um, so as we practice uh, restorative justice or as we do truth and reconciliation processes. We do it in that mind. We do it with that kind of intersectional consciousness. Um, I, I think that's really, really important, that we support uh, Occupy. We support uh, Bernie, because they are about 
uh, creating a more equitable and restorative, if you will, uh, economic system. Uh, we support uh, uh, Indian Rock uh, and, and the activists there because they are protectors of our water. Uh, we support you know, a lot of the activism, uh, Black Lives Matter. Um, so I think as we do this work, it's just important. You know, in the 60s, we tended to be more single issue. We had a march on Washington in 1963, which was historic, but it was singularly focused on, uh, the civil, on getting a Civil Rights Act passed, uh, on formal equality, legal equality for black people who were uh, uh, subordinated by a Jim Crow, a system of Jim Crow segregation. And that was the issue that 250,000 people marched about uh, August 28, 1963. And a lot of our marches and demonstrations at that time were singly focused. They, they would sometimes call us special interest groups. But today we're seeing more intersectionalism and I think, uh, or more intersectionality in the way that we engage in activism. And I think that we who do restorative justice and we who are doing this truth and reconciliation work uh, would be well advised to, uh, to do the same. Can I make one comment about, so I think this question as we're, as we're trying to think about what direction do we go in and what do we favor, this question about the role of accountability, which most of us who work deeply in terms of restorative justice think a lot about, it's often erroneously juxtaposition to accountability which then gets slipped in as criminal liable. That's what the criminal system does. Yeah. When in fact, and in this particular context, never so true, that we have to take a very long look at our history of criminal justice and the extent to which it has included accountability for whom, mm -hmm. about what, at what cost. And so I'm not saying you were suggesting this, I'm no. building upon your point. No. Or I'm saying, look, I, I think we have to not say there's no place for the criminal justice system, but I don't think there's a place for the criminal justice system in the way in which we have been replicating injustices and inequality through that system. Yeah. And I think we have to be very, very careful. And so maybe this is the call for how do we think about what needs to happen at a national level, mm -hmm. that we don't actually undermine the case for collective responsibility which requires acknowledgement, which requires truth, but re which requires a level of complexity that sometimes we don't get out of our backward focused notions of accountability. You are accountable for the past, you are responsible for the future, and we need somehow to ensure that the processes we construct are capable of generating in sophisticated ways this sense of collective responsibility, this, which maybe was fitting with this outrage conversation we had earlier, but translating that into action. And some of our efforts and calls for whatever passes for justice, and I get that craving, in terms of individual accountability, actually undermines. The one thing the criminal justice system is flat out awful at is understanding individual accountability in the context of complex uh, circumstances and collective responsibility. In fact, it's been a great effort at locating our collective responsibility and finding the bad guy. It's a wrong story about these kinds of situations and historic, but broad-based, you know, comprehensive harms. And so, that's not, it has no place, but we have to ver like think very carefully about the place it has and when it is used in a way that makes the other work more difficult, I think. Yeah, could I just uh, build on that and clarify a little bit? Um, I think what we need are very serious reforms to our criminal justice well, system. Yes. Now, criminal justice should be a bulwark of accountability because it should stop the people who killed the Greensboro or et cetera. It should hold police, other individuals who commit these kind of abuses sure. um, liable. And, you know, it's it's central to the rule of law. It's central to transitional justice. On the Mike, Mike, she said. Oh, it's central to the rule of law. Central to transitional justice. Um, I th that's my Just th reform. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. This is my point. Um, but when you have a system that's not working, like our criminal justice system, is at least in many important respects not working or is not producing just results. You need reform, just like if it was Argentina. Argentina, for a long time, had a, a criminal justice system that produced very bad results. 
part of the change in a place like Argentina happen because you ultimately reform the system. And so its reform is a key element of ensuring that you're, you're, you're one of the bulwarks of society, and that is a, a properly, properly functioning criminal justice system does promote the rule of law and does not do the reverse. So I think we're on the same page, but I appreciate uh, you giving me the chance for that clarification. If I can, but I think that we need to deconstruct crime. Mm. What is crime? Is it, you know, the young, the black youth on the street selling drugs? Well, what about the big pharmaceuticals that produce drugs that we find out, you know, 10 years later are, are causing cancer and, and, and early deaths. Uh, what about the Wall Street speculators who have devastated uh, working people's lives by, by, by you know, destroying their life savings and their pensions? Um, what about the predatory lenders who you know, gave these terrible loans to black people who are now homeless and filling the streets? You know, the crime of structural racism, you know, that's, I just, it's, it's, re it's really, it boggles my mind that when we think about crime, we, we think about black youth primarily, you know, uh, when the, the criminals that, that, are per, that, are, that are perpetuating massive harm uh, on, a, on a, an order of magnitude that is unimaginable just go scot-free. The 1%, you know? Um, so. I think that we need to start thinking more broadly and critically about what crime is in, in this culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, open the floor to any questions because I know that my next question is yet another question that will lead us to, uh, uh, to, uh, to I think, a, a, a potential land of... Overtime. No, I was thinking negativity. <laughs> I, like, I, know, I know what my question is. Um, Carmen. Hello. That's really loud. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I am a millennial, and I'm also a second-year law student. So my filter is through those lens. And a lot of times what I see, I know some people mention social media, what I see from my peers is like this spike of a reaction when there's a pressing news story about an officer that shot another black man. And then there's protests or riots but then it trickles down and it, it kind of goes away. So I guess my question is, for me as a millennial, what can I do because I'm not in my career yet and a lot of my peers are not in their careers yet so we don't have a seat at this table that you guys might have and I would one day want to be as smart as you, I'm just going to throw that out there. But what can I do now pre-career to try and affect change? What's that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you want to collect uh, like a couple of questions and then let the panel react? Uh, Excellent. Uh, I wanted to tell you that um, I was the first descendant that they found from Georgetown slaves. Oh, yes. I thought uh, you where's Seth? Familiar. Another first Seth. I thought yeah. you looked familiar. You were in the New York Times. Yes. Yeah, I saw that That's picture. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to Wonderful. tell you that. And. Um, Chief's description of, um, I hate to tell you that mostly we call for violence, uh, victims who are black, and we find that the victim knows the, the one who committed the violence and that one is also black, and that there is this gap um, between the policing part of it um, and the community, sort of. And, and the gap, if you will, are the institutions. And I'm wondering, I've been thinking about this a lot, why more police chiefs who are suffering from this gap that you're left to solve only by going in where you called and knowing that other institutions are letting you down by not taking their part and how they have caused this situation. I'm wondering why more police chiefs don't call, call out the rest of the institutions for the role they're not playing. Let me take, I'll take the remaining two questions up there and then I'll ask the panel, Max. 
Uh, uh, thank you so much again for coming. Um, I just had a quick little question about uh, um, just where where we can create time for ref reflection. Um, I think it was in my uh, last summer, I worked at the Public Defender's Office, and I can't remember exactly how the quote went, but it went something along the lines, if, if you wanted to be a social worker, you really should be a police officer. If you wanted to be a police officer, you really should be a social worker based on the type of work that they do. <laughs> um, and, and I saw that uh, um, in my last semester with uh, Professor Stoughton. Um, he required us to go uh, on a police ride-along, and um, I was kind of secretly hoping to you know, see something. Uh, you know, bad action in, in the back of my mind, but of course, uh, luckily, uh, I had a really awesome police officer who was really engaged and uh, just approach every um, interaction they had in a kind of problem-solving mentality. Uh, one, one of the people that he talked with um, was had the had the police called on him because his mom thought that he was going to burn down her car, and they get engaged in like a good big, good thirty-minute-long discussion about. Um, how he didn't have a job, how he didn't have an education, and all these things. And I was like, wow, he's, he's basically doing career counseling for him right now. Um, and I mean, he, he uh, told him to join the military, which I was kind of, uh, felt a little bad about, which kind of goes to your economic uh, issues that are in, in, in play as well. But um, he, he tried, the police officer did. And um, I just wondered if, um, from a law enforcement uh, standpoint, and, and just basically from all of our standpoints, uh, we, we only have so much limited time. Um, should there be uh, increased role or just increased time and in, in funding for reflection periods? Um, and that's, that's my question. And the last question. And then I'll ask the panelists. You don't need to address every question, but just within the group of questions, feel free to address each question. I guess my question would be, do you think we could go back to a year of Jubilee? Is that every 50 years we reshuffle the deck? We could hear it. Go back to every 50 years we seem to reshuffle the deck, so perhaps we should just have a Jubilee, jubilee to reshuffle. More, more observations. It was a Old Testament biblical principle that every 50 years you, you recycled everything so that uh, yeah. if somebody had sold themselves into uh, you know servitude to, to somebody else then they they became free and that if you had property that you had given up uh, you know because of some situation that had happened then it was a biblical principle then that that property was then re-returned to to the family so there was a a, an opportunity for restoration and an opportunity to be able to redistribute back and enable people to get restored justice. Restored justice. David, I think I'll start with you on the far end and we'll work our way towards me if that's okay. I was hoping you'd go the other way. Uh, um, just uh, just two or three comments. One uh, in terms of uh, social media and and the comment about Black Lives Matter, which I think are so important to mobilizing public opinion uh, in this country and around the world now. Uh, and I really salute what Black Lives Matter has done, particularly uh, around Ferguson and uh, in a number of other instances. One of the things that I kind of ask my, myself this question, and maybe it's because of my age, but you know, I, when I think of the 60s civil rights struggle, there was a very clear political strategy, I think, from the beginning, it seemed like to me. Uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference had a, a, a political strategy, which was legis ultimately was legislative, which affected enormous change. And I think this is one of the things that I find really challenging um, in a, such a diffuse world with so much social media and so many different groups and uh, fractured political parties and so forth. Um, the energy and the political strategy that 
a more uh, committed group of cadres would have done in the 50s or the 60s or maybe the early 70s with the environmental movement probably doesn't exist any longer. It's very much fractured. And so I, I think one of the really important questions is how do you have a political strategy in such a fragmented communication kind of environment. So, um, uh, yeah, Martin Luther King uh, had a very clear, I think had a pretty clear strategy. Um, the uh, NAACP had a pretty clear strategy. They, they may not have been on the same page all of the time, but they had certain political objectives. And now we have a much more diffuse movement. And th there's some great things about that in terms of uh, mobilizing people and, 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 and social change. But what are the objectives that are trying to be achieved now, I think sometimes can be a little less clear. I don't think a legislative agenda is perhaps what we're aiming at. What are we, what are we aiming at? It's a, it, the social movements are much different today. And I think that's something that we all probably need to, at least I need to, uh, um, much better understand. Um, and I, I uh, being raised as, a, as an evangelical in the South, I, I know about, I remember the passage about the 30 years, but I don't remember anybody ever exercising or coming close to giving, giving back uh, um, for some reason. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe if we took, uh, we actually tithe to our causes 10%, we might actually, uh, uh, if we were devoting our, our personal resources in a very committed kind of way, that might make a difference. Um, and I think the other question was for, for the, a couple of the other questions were for the chief, so I will let him answer those. So, so I'll start with, um, with the first question and I don't, I don't, necessarily have the best answer for you because I'm not a, I am an activist, but I'm a different kind of an activist, I suppose, okay? Um, but I do think you have to get involved and I think you have to grace the doors of the people in power. And I think you have to share perspectives and opinions and sensitize uh, people to the concerns that you have uh, because it puts a human face on a problem and it puts a relationship in play. And most things get done through relationships. Uh, and it's where influence is at its best. And, and so, you know, if, if, you're, if you're not at the top of an organization that wields power, where do you, 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 you may not, you may or may not get there in your lifetime, but you can still have a positive impact on change. But I would say that in, in this police community relationship, it's important that we get to know you and your concern, but it's also helpful if you get to know us. Uh, we recently held in Greenville a forum, a Young Democrats forum, and it was hosted because of all the change at the national level, right, the presidential election primarily, uh, and a lot of the rhetoric over the last year and a half uh, related that election and subsequent questions that have come up. So we had members of our gay community, we had Hispanic uh, Alliance members there, we had Black Lives Matter, we had a number of uh, different groups represented, interest groups, who had concerns about the direction of policing in Greenville. And so the sheriff, the new, newly elected sheriff and I were there to answer questions. Um, it, to me, it was, a, it was an important forum because it, was, it, it enabled us to have some back and forth. Uh, and it enabled some of my staff to hear some of the sensitivities and concerns and to hear my perspective on those, and, but, but to hear the community's perspective on those. But an interesting thing, because 
I, I, I'm going to ask you just a couple of questions, if I may, and raise your hand. And, and I really do ask you to be honest. So is, is having your police department reflect the composition of the community in terms of race and gender? <coughs> is that important to you? Most hands go up. And in community surveys, and I've done community surveys uh, in Charlotte, in Greensboro, and now in Greenville, and we're just getting in another week, we're implementing another one. And we hire a company to do it, and we don't know what the results are until they come back. So there's no influence over those results from us. The numbers are what the numbers are. Either our programs are working or they're not. And we need, to, we need to figure out what's driving low numbers around satisfaction, trust, things like that. Um, but, but when I asked that question, most hands went up in the room and there were about 85, 90 people in the room. And then, so I asked the next question, how many of you all have referred somebody you know to become a police officer? Okay. More hands went up in this room today than went up in that room. And in that room, only one African American's hand went up. And, and so it is important, but it's, uh, as, as David mentioned earlier, it is everyone's problem. It's not just the police problem. It is our community's problem, community by community. It, we all have to take ownership of this relationship uh, trust concern. And we have to work and identify first the common goals and work toward achieving those goals, I think, incrementally. We can talk about the bigger picture at the national level and criminal justice reform, and I think those things are important and they do influence our actions at a, at a local level. But I also think that much like politics, policing is local. Um, but being involved and understanding and, and getting to know people in those areas, if it's police, you're here, so I'm, I'm, it may just be because you're in law school, which is great, by the way, but um, it could be because just this topic alone is that important to you. And if it is, I would say you need to, you, you can get involved one-on-one um, -on -one with your police department. I, I would find very, I think there would be very few that wouldn't, well, I can't say that. I wish I could say that. I wish I could say that. I can't say that. Um, I, I will also, uh, just to answer Maxine's question, um, why don't I call out the rest of the institutions? I do, but probably more quietly than you'd like. Um, so, so we try workarounds because politically, I'm, I'm appointed, so I have a boss. And police chiefs are appointed either by a city manager or a mayor. So uh, councils and mayors like some stability and order in the operation of government. And so if you make too many waves too quickly with too many people, you're the problem. And so I could quickly become the problem and be gone and really affect no change. So I have to work through the structures and the institutions and everything. So I, I think we're just subject to that kind of a climate. And so, um, I'm not so sure I understood the, the one question about more reflection. And I don't know if you could just give me a little bit, if that was intended for me. It was. I was wondering if, um, in particular, um, if the role of police could be expanded to be more than just you know, administrative, administration of laws and enforcing. And instead, you know, maybe I know maybe you already do this, have training or periods where they can actually go and talk with um, the people they interact with or have like little mini truth commissions. I don't know, but uh, we, just right. We actually probably do more of that than you know. Um, and I can't speak for every police agency, um, but municipal police agencies uh, probably do it more than you know. And um, it is an important function. 
uh, uh, to be able to understand what a community needs and to be able to try and focus your police response to those needs still doesn't get at some of the core issues that we've talked about here today. But that is, uh, by and large, what I think a lot of police departments do. Um, and, and that helps the relationship, but it still doesn't get at what undergirds all of the conflict, I think. Um, and I will, uh, I'm going to jump right back uh, on the institutional thing, uh, pressure. We, some of the workarounds we do, um, we create partnerships around certain things. So if you're familiar with David Kennedy's work on, on, in fine. reducing uh, gun violence, and uh, it's called, we call it focus deterrence, at least in policing circles. So we've recently implemented that. So that's a message. <laughs> Uh, to offenders um, that we're not going to accept the violence anymore, but you have community, you have family, you have um, uh, social uh, uh, services um, and nonprofits who are all here in the room to help you, and we want you to have that help. But we're here to hold you accountable because you're victimizing people in your communities, and your communities are tired of it. And so, so we, we do those kinds of partnerships to bring people in, but they tend to be smaller scale, not as um, pervasive as they should be, perhaps, across. So in the interest yeah, I was, I was, Jennifer has, has I was actually going to say, if you want inspiration, then you should no. look to I look for inspiration. So I think I'll, I'll see my time on that. She's your time to no, find you. And I see that Mary Burton has arrived, which oh, is extraordinary. Yay, yay. We're thrilled to have you here. <laughs> We, we, are holding over, we are holding over for, for your remarks, so Fania will make her remarks, and then I'll invite Mary to join us here on the, on the dais to make some remarks. Fania. Welcome, Mary, and the inspiration is mutual, please, let me tell you. Um, so on, on the movements, on the comment that was made by uh, David a moment ago, in the 60s it seemed that the movements were very strategic, very focused, um, very methodical. Today it seems um, less, more fractured, less organized. Um, you know, I think about Ella Baker um, when she talks about leadership um, because the civil rights movement in many ways was a top-down um, uh, or represented a top-down leadership style uh, with a charismatic figure um, at the top. And Ella Baker was always one to say, um, and SNCC, you know, you're all leaders. There's no one single expert or leader. Um, and it seems to me that that's the style of leadership that we're seeing today in the movements. Um, in Ferguson, for example, the media would accuse the youth of having a leaderless movement. And they would say, no, we have a leaderful movement. They would rattle off the names of, you know, 20 or 30 individuals. Um, and so, you know, there's something different happening. I think we're moving away from that top-down idea of leadership. Um, and, you know, when you talk about systems thinking, uh, how things self-organize, we're looking at more of that. And, and I think it, we don't understand it yet, yeah. but there is some, even though it seems chaotic, mm -hmm. there's, there's some, some pattern, something that is emerging, uh, some pattern that's emerging through the chaos. Um, I mean, that's kind of the way that I see it. I mean, even with the women's movement, January 21st, I mean, you look at August 28th, 1963, they planned that, yep. that march for years. I mean, A. Philip Randolph was talking about that march some 20 years before it ha happened, in the 40s he was talking about it. And so it was, you know, it was like a, a strategy, a wartime strategy. They, had, they were very methodical about it. Um, on the other hand, the January 21st march, the largest march, I believe, in, in history, uh, especially if you consider what was going on internationally as well, it happened the day after the election. One, one woman out in Hawaii said, we need to march on Washington on the day of the inauguration. She went to bed, she got up in the morning, there were 10,000 yeses. Uh, and that's how the January 21st march started. And there wasn't a whole lot of prep work, there wasn't a lot of letters and email, I mean, there were a lot of emails flying. But it, it just, it happened, it, it, it emerged you know, from the grassroots in such a huge dramatic way. I mean, I, I went and I was coming from 
San Francisco via uh, Salt Lake City. And in Salt Lake City, I saw this, uh, this uh, mob of women uh, in pink hats. And uh, they were being irreverent, they were having fun, they were laughing. Um, and uh, I got on the plane and it was nothing but pink hats. You know, in Salt Lake City, going to the march, you know. And I, then I said, this is going to be bigger than anybody ever thought. Because at that time, they were thinking 150,000, maybe 250,000, but it turned out to be about a million. But anyway, so I, I, don't, I don't think, I wouldn't say that the movements back then were more organized and more strategic, and the ones today are more fractured. I think that we're seeing something different and new, and I'd love to see what it turns out to be. Number two, on the Jubilee, I think, I like the idea of the Jubilee. Jubilee, ju, jubilee justice, oh yeah. Uh, because it points to the need for a more equitable economic system. Uh, we have an economic system that has become what it is and as powerful as it is, but also as weak as it is, because of, uh, of, of slavery, because of genocide, because of the expropriation of millions of people's labor, and because of consigning them to subhuman uh, status. It has become what it is based on the expropriation of land and the genocide of, 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 of uh, Native Americans. And today, it still wreaks havoc. Today, um, I read the Fed had a study that says in a crisis, more than half of Americans would not be able to come up with $400 in cash. There's a lot of economic pain going on in this country, and not just in the Rust Belt. And it kind of surprised us with the election of Trump. But you know, this, cap, this system of capital, we got to start naming it. Uh, deregulation and, and, and decreasing taxes and cutting social spending. It's creating havoc. Uh, and it can, all, all of the suffering that we're seeing today, I think, can be traced to that. So this looking at our economy and coming up with a jubilee uh, uh, economy, really, or a restorative there's economy. Enough, there's enough money. There's plenty there of money. Houses, yeah. There are enough land. Yes. There's enough food. Yes. It's not, it, but we have developed a conversation around scarcity yeah. as opposed to around abundance. Yeah, absolutely. So the truth of the matter is, and that's why I think youth, and um, this gets to the question, this gets to the, the comment made by the young sister who said she's a millennial. Uh, millennials are not afraid of socialism. More than half uh, want socialism or prefer socialism over capitalism. Um, and I, I think that, that, you know, yeah, that's, 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 there is some wisdom in the, in, in, in the millennials that, that we are seeing. Uh, millennials are less likely to be homophobic, um, and that's, that's been made clear through studies. And historically, millennials have been, not, sorry, not millennials, um, but youth have been the ones who have driven uh, social transformation when it is most needed. Uh, it was school children, six, seven years old, that braved the dogs and the hoses uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, and brought the system of segregation tumbling down. It was college students that went on the freedom rides that, uh, that, that caused the, uh, the, the, the result in the passage of the public accommodations laws. It was college students who went to Mississippi um, and, and, and did voter registration and went to Selma that resulted in voting rights. Uh, it was youth at uh, uh, Stone, what was the name of the? Stone Wall. Stone Wall. Stone, Stone, Stone what? Stone Wall. Was it Stone Wall? Okay. That, that their protest resulted in, in, in LGBTQ rights. So uh, I just want us to say that youth um, are the ones historically that that are called on. History calls on you and is calling on you. And youth are answering the call, and we see that with Black Lives Matter. So, um, and we saw it in my generation. And now, you know, it's your generation's time. Uh, and I would say that just answering history's call by, uh, by you know, coming to events like this, by uh, having dialogues, healing dialogues with your local police, uh, and um, by being a warrior and a healer, 
Uh, that is what I would suggest. And we, as elders, are there to support you um, and to offer uh, advice uh, when you ask for it. Uh, but I, I just cannot overemphasize the power of youth when it comes to uh, leading and driving uh, social change. And being hope, not just having hope, but being the hope. As, as Cornel West says, having hope is too detached and too spectatorial. We need you to be hope. Well, Farnia Davis has taken us to a, a wonderful and optimistic place to end this panel. I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking the panel. I do recognize that I allow the panel to run a little bit long and to free will, but I just thought that at, it, I don't like symposia to have as their goal to try to tie everything into a neat little bow in the end. I think it feels very artificial to me. I prefer ones that leave us asking more questions than when we came in the door. And I'm grateful to all the panelists so far for that. I'm going to ask the panelists actually to stay here in the interest of time okay. and, uh, and introduce our final speaker and, who has, who one week ago, would not have even known this event was taking place, I need to tell you. Mary oh, Burton, oh. <laughs> who flew in from South Africa, flew in because Yasmin Asuka, oh. her good friend and colleague from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, was due to come and speak and uh, had a medical emergency and said, I understand the importance to you, actually it was less than a week ago, said I understand the importance to you of having the South African experience represented here and discussed here. And she reached out to Mary on that short a notice and said, can you fly over from South Africa? And Mary's gone through as you know, additional oh, flight delays yes. to be with us. We are, Mary has an extraordinary history of engagement, of civic engagement, of uh, engagement on the issues that we'll be talking about today that are outlined in your, in your program. But I, I will say uh, two things. First, it speaks to the engagement of all of our speakers here and the amount of engagement that we see in the community in a variety of different ways, I think is, is encapsulated in our final speaker, Mary Burton, who, as I said, has, has been a commissioner on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission but has had a variety of other experiences on restorative justice issues. And Mary, it's our pleasure to welcome you. Welcome to Columbia, South Carolina, through your many uh, travels. And we look forward to hearing your observations on the TRC experience in restorative justice. Thank you very much. Yeah. Long, long journey. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, into it because uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, I, I do apologize for all the long delays in getting here, I must say. It's been a very, very long journey full of, mm. full of problems and issues, but here I am anyway. So I'm sorry I missed all the morning sessions. Very sorry because I would have liked to hear so much more of what was said. Um, it's really quite hard to know where to begin. Um, in, in, in yes, yes. Still, still a problem. Okay. Can you pull up a little bit? Or yeah. you have, oh, you've got it's, um, it's difficult to know to, where to start when I know that there have been so many things said all day. But two things, perhaps, to begin anyway. Um, in all my travels, I have been glued to uh, the media from South Africa because today there were thousands of marches turned mm. out in our major cities um, in not only calls, although they were very focused on recalling um, President Zuma, mm. um, but also uh, arguing and, and pleading for a return to corrupt free government. Mm. So it's much bigger really than a question of the recall of the president and as our recently demoted finance minister said it's going to be 20 or 30 years of making up for what has been going wrong in recent years. Mm -hmm. And so that makes me realize that for all of us, none of these things are quick. And we can be inspired and we can be moved by the Jubilee Year arguments, which my mentor in the Black Sash, Sheena Duncan, used to bring up regularly. Um, and. There are so many steps along the way, but you've got to preserve them. And I think that's one of the things that we didn't do right in South Africa. We heaved such a huge sigh of relief after our new democratic government was elected with, and, uh, and brought into with President Mandela in office that everybody sat back and thought the kingdom had come. Mm -hmm. And it's not like that. Mm -hmm. And so we are seeing now the result partly of all the years of the apartheid legacy but also the years of our own 
inaction on the issues that have remained. And I'd like to talk about the question of policing because one of the dreadful things through the many, many public hearings of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission was the number of black policemen who were murdered by their own communities, seen as sellouts, seen as the easiest target, the closest target, whereas the white police were just at one further remove from the ghettoized areas. And so it isn't easy to transform the diversity of organizations that have been seen as oppressive. Um, and yet it is absolutely essential to do. So I think that's part of what you're trying to do here, is how do you get to that point? And that, I think, then would make me talk about the things that I wanted to say about restorative justice programs, that there's a lot of work that needs to be done beforehand, before you get there, as well as afterwards. Um, and one of them is to have the whole concept and what it would mean for each community discussed broadly with all stakeholders well in advance so that people feel that they have been consulted, they feel that they have been uh, part of the process, that their own views and their own, um, the, the people who work with them and live with them um, are part of the process, that it isn't only a question of, of these and these people at extreme ends of antagonism, but it's a much broader network of bringing in um, a wide section of the, of the local community that is going to have to live with whatever process of restorative justice is brought in. And then, once a process is underway, I think it was one of our first favorite words in the South African struggle was transparency. So much had been hidden, so much had been denied. To be open, to be accountable, to be visible, uh, to answer to the, the questions, the doubts, the misgivings, the anger that people have. Um, just to be ready to explain if, if, you are, if one is having a commission of, of some kind and, a, and a public hearings, to explain to people what the objective is, what the goal is, to let them ask questions, to let them put their demands and wishes for the process to be the best that, that it can be. And then, in a way slightly converse to that, to beware of raising expectations because I think that was another mistake we made, that we thought too much could be achieved with one, one truth commission. And it isn't like that. The, the, all the truth commission can do, if, especially if it's a short-term one like so many of them are, is expose what has happened and allow people to, to confront the reality of what the other in their community has been through and then to try and deal with some process of, of transitional restoration, reparations. Um, for us at the moment in South Africa, the word is restitution because it's much bigger than just individual reparations. Um, but if you raise the hopes too high, then you're going to get the kind of letdown that we have in South Africa where the South African TRC is not loved by anybody in South Africa and definitely rejected by the student movement. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and, yet, and yet, if you don't create expectations and hope, as somebody else said, <laughs> um, then, then it's not going to give you any of the um, relief and um, belief that things can be better. So you have to find a balance between um, not, not dreaming too high, and yet on the other hand to have the dreams and to let everybody have the dreams and to express their dreams as part of the preparation for what is going to be a long and, and difficult process. Um, and then just, just to go back to South Africa, um, we have had considerable turmoil in our universities in the last two years. And the demands now are for decolonization and transformation. And that is because of our past, and it's because of the past of so many of the new countries of the world. Um, and it's a, it's a daily issue, it's on social media, it's, it's in the pronouncements of every um, public personality. I don't know how much coverage you get of the South African news, but it, it's very, very interesting. And all of us are in that debate about decolonization and what it really means for us. Did decolonization have any benefits? 
did colonization have any benefits? You can argue it back and forth. It's very, very strongly, and people do. Um, transformation, yes, we need it. We need it in our curriculum, we need it in our uh, student profiles, we need it in our staffing profiles. Um, and that is also about facing up to the reality of, of life today in South Africa. And in many ways, you're far ahead of us. Um, and yet there are these, these issues that still remain. And so, yes, the, the, the whole concept of Black Lives Matter is very real in South Africa, particularly in the student movement, but not only. Um, and I think that what today and the last few days have taught us in South Africa is that it's back to the drawing boards and it's back to the community work it's back to building from the bottom. It's back to raising, making the political parties be what they should be, representative of the people, accountable to the people, um, and confronting the issues of each community, just like the United Democratic Front did in South Africa during the apartheid years, mm -hmm. working from street to street, women's issues, health issues, the local health clinics, the rubbish removal, the state of the roads, those things that made every person feel that their issue was important and that their issue was recognized as important. And that's what built the movement uh, against apartheid. And I think that that is the only way in the end because politicians will always get swept up in the uses and the abuses and the pleasures of power and the belief that they can fix everything, whereas in fact it can only be fixed by the participation of citizens, mm -hmm. holding the authorities to account, but also working constantly themselves in police community forums, in schools, in our terrible education system, in health clinics. And one of the heritages that, that is, uh, South Africa's TRC left was in the concept of speak outs and having public speak outs on local issues. So, for example, the Black Sash uh, organized for the South African Human Rights Commission to come to a small town on our east coast where there was virtually no provision of health services whatsoever. There were horrendous stories of people having to push their family members in wheelbarrows to the nearest town where there might be a clinic. Ambulances didn't work, the roads were too bad, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they organized a speak out under the auspices of the Human Rights Commission and the authorities, the local municipality, the local health council, the local health service providers came and they listened all day long to what it was like to be poor and remote from service centers and to encounter illness and need. And now a new health center is being built and the ambulances are already back and running. So the health center will be, it's that kind of victory that makes people feel that things are going to change. Thank, thank you, Mary. I want to thank you. It is very rare to have an event that starts at 9 in the morning and ends at 5.30 and to see so many faces who are here throughout the day. I know some of you have come at the end of the day and others had to leave. But I want to thank you for your engagement. And I want to remind you very briefly of what I said at the very beginning, which is that as it relates to this particular conversation, here in Columbia, this is only a starting point. Uh, and I look forward to the continued engagement of the speakers in the days to come, and of, of the members of the community who've been here, I say, uh, I look forward to staying in touch with you. I hope that you've left your contact information um, uh, with, with our team. We, this is, I do not know what form this will take. I wouldn't pretend to know what form this will take, but what I can promise you is that this will take uh, on a life here in Columbia uh, I, 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 knowing how universities work to the extent that it's related to the university, it will start in the fall, but with a, a robust program where we map out what this conversation going forward can look like with a goal of developing concrete ideas and concrete plans that the, the germs of which, the seeds of which were planted here today. And uh, I thank you all for being here. And I thank again all of our speakers for their, uh, for their thoughts and observations. So thank you all.